How am I going to get that head out of that uh, uterus? I'm sitting in Jane Furr's hospital in Sekakuni land because making a big incision in the skin and then making a big incision in the uterus and then putting your hands in the uterus, I think is very old fashioned and it's dangerous. It can, there's a better way that everybody can learn. <laughs> very much and as as excited are you so am i as excited to be able to speak to so many people because i think it's a wonderful opportunity for me to speak to um the people of your area and also northern mozambique and malawi and zimbabwe and any other person that wants to log on and i'm going to be talking about cesarean section techniques um the best cesarean section surgical technique does it exist what I want you to do and your friends and colleagues in the area to do is to ask questions as they come. Not Don't keep them for the end. Keep them for uh, being timely, timely and contemporaneous so we can address your questions as they arise. So your first slide um, is as follows. We're going to be talking about contemporary evidence and um, a practical approach. We're not keeping this academic. We're talking about hands-on, how to do cesarean sections practically and safely. And it's important that this is being done, especially in rural areas where sometimes the um, training is not as good as it might be. I don't have any disclosures. And I'm just going to tell you, Dakala, about three studies. It's not important to know all the literature. There might be some registrars writing exams, it's true. But I'm only going to be studying, uh, talking about three studies and the usefulness. There's many, many things in literature written about um, cesarean section data. But it's more important that we just talk about the practical aspects. We're going to talk about then the literature. There's just three studies. We're going to talk about options for delivery of the baby's head, which is one of the most important parts of a Caesar. I'm going to do some video clips and show you how um, it can be done and then finally should you change your technique or should you stay where you are on the left at the bottom is a picture of me <coughs> excuse me i was a third year student doing my very first delivery um, at a place called tembiza i don't know if anybody knows tembiza hospital and uh, that's near uh, kempton park and tembiza hospital over there you can see my first baby being born i delivered it and then on the right hand side is my very first cesarean section with Mike Roberts, who's from Namibia. And uh, those two then go back 40 years, those two pictures. The most common operation in the world is cesarean section. And I was giving this talk the other day and the person said, no, the most common operation in the world is actually circumcision. That might be true. <clears throat> but let's say the most common operation in the woman is cesarean section. And the rates have been increasing since 1955 when I was born. As you can see over there on the slide, the present data showed the rates is around about 30% for cesarean sections. And in our country, in um, South Africa, the rates for uh, rural areas and also for government department practice is actually just under uh, 30, it's 29%. In private practice, it's at least double that. Now, are we doing too many cesarean sections or are we doing too few cesarean sections? I just want to show you over here. Accurate rates, it's the second um, sentence, accurate rates of Caesar is difficult to quantify, but the incidence of cesarean deliveries varies from less than 1% in some parts of Africa to over 50% in China. Now, the important thing over here is that if you live in a country like Burkina Faso, thank you very much, uh, Ashley, if you um, live in Burkina Faso, or Ethiopia, where the cesarean section rate is 1%, it's extremely, extremely dangerous for the mother and the baby. 
And um, I'll come to show you why you should have more cesarean sections than merely 1%. In South Africa, as I said, it's around 80% in the private sector and just under 30% in the public sector. Now, one of the things about cesarean delivery um, uh, methods is that the techniques are very non-standard. You won't find one standard cesarean section technique. Let me give you an example. If you're going to do an operation for stress incontinence, the caller will tell you that you do a TVT because that's the one operation everybody does is the best operation with the highest rate of success and everybody knows how to do it using one method. So that's a homogenous technique and it's standard. But in cesarean sections, that's not the case. Everybody's got their own favorite techniques. There's a study, the second line there, uh, called the Coronas Randomized Controlled Trial. The Coronas Randomized Controlled Trial looks at the prospect of studies <coughs> the biggest prospective study to date and it shows you what options you have for cesarean sections. Now the importance of knowing the best cesarean section technique is that if you have a million cesarean sections being done, if you have a better technique that's safer and that's quicker and that's better for the baby, you must know which it is <clears throat> to make sure that the best options are given to women at this big level. Is anybody wanting to ask a question? Yeah, someone asked a question. I'm just going to ask Ashley to see who's the question and what's the question. Okay. Then, important, ladies and gentlemen, there's no place for surgical arrogance. Now, what is surgical arrogance? Surgical arrogance is one person saying and thinking in their heads that they're the best surgeon. I remember when I was um, starting out, there was a, one of our senior colleagues said, there's two ways of doing a cesarean section. There's my way and the wrong way. In other words, he said his way was the best way. I don't believe there is the best way for everybody, but let's look at a few options over here. This first over here, I want you to take a screenshot. It's a systematic review of evidence-based surgery for cesarean delivery. It comes from America and from a guy called Joshua Dalkey. And this is an important study because it looks at lots and lots, dozens and dozens of randomized trials and dozens and dozens of reviews. And if you want one review, this is one of the few. I'm giving you three. This is the first one I want you to remember. So I hope you've taken your screenshot. In this particular uh, article from 2013, they looked at 73 randomized controlled trials. They looked at 10 meta-analyses and 12 Cochrane reviews of methodology for cesarean sections. Now, what did they find? What is the best way? Well, firstly, prophylactic antibiotics. This is a recommendation. All cesarean deliveries should have pre-op a single dose prophylactic administration intravenously given. And the one that is probably the best thing to do is a second generation or first generation kefalosporin. We use kefzol. And if you do this uh, before the baby's out, um, we usually do it after the cord has been clamped so the baby doesn't get the kefzol. It's the mother that gets the kefzol. So when the baby's out and the cord's clamped, you can give her the kefzol, which definitely reduces the amount of post-operative uh, post surgical sepsis. Uterine incisions, there's a way of doing it, and we'll have a look at those in a minute. Placental removal. We usually wait for the placenta to be spontaneously given, uh, to, uh, the placenta to be spontaneously delivered. You don't have to grovel it out. How do you close the uterus? Now, if you have a look over there, they say one layer. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is optional. You can do one layer or you can do two layers. And I would say if you do two layers, it's probably the better way, and we'll see how to close the uterus. Subcutaneous closure, should you close the fat layer or the subcutaneous layer? If the woman is slightly bigger, in other words, the subcutaneous fat layer is more than two centimeters, you should close it. There's no point in doing a drain. And then in terms of the needles, we look at sutures and needles, the best option for avoiding um, sticking your, your uh, assistant is using blunt needles. 
Also, if the woman happens to be HIV positive, then we would adv uh, strongly advise blunt needles. Just remember also, ladies and gentlemen, there is no controversy in um, should you use Clexane or not? Should you use thromboprophylaxis in obstetrics and gynecology? I wrote this paper two years ago. It was published in uh, 2018. And I'd also advise you to take a screenshot because it gives you the recommendations for thromboprophylaxis in obstetrics and gynecology. Who needs thromboprophylaxis in ONG and when to give it and how to give it? That paper will tell you all you need to know. We don't have time to go into it, but we would suggest that it's a very good idea post cesarean delivery to strongly consider the use of uh, heparin in these women um, depending on their, um, their size. Now here's the second trial I want you to remember. You can take a snapshot of this. Uh, uh, this is the Coronas trial. It's a randomized controlled trial and this is a very, very important because it's a powerful way of looking at data and many thousands of people were randomized and the outcomes I'll come to in a minute. So get your screenshot of this one so you can track that down. It was first thought of in 2007. It took 10 years to, to actually publish the outcomes. And um, what they looked at over there is should you do blunt or sharp entry to the abdomen? And the outcome here was looking at the incidence of hernias. So should you go in blunt or sharp when you enter the peritoneal cavity? The second thing is when you repair the uterus, should you take it out or exteriorize it, or should you do an internal repair? And the um, outcome they looked at then was the risk of infertility or ectopic pregnancy after the cesarean delivery. The third they looked at was, should you close the, close the uterus in a single or a double layer? And the outcome there was the risk of maternal death or pregnancy complications and subsequent uh, pregnancies. The fourth variable they looked at in this very important study was, should you close or should you not close the peritoneum with sutures? And the outcome measurement here was the risk of pelvic adhesions or the risk of infertility in subsequent uh, pregnancies. And then the final thing they looked at, which suture should you use? Should you use cat gut or chromic as we call it, or polyglactin, or vicryl, as we call it. And the outcome over there they looked at was the risk of subsequent adverse pregnancy outcomes like uterine rupture. So these then, these five things are contentious issues. Which of those pairs should you do to give you the better uh, cesarean delivery technique? Yes, to Carla. No questions. Okay, then I'll carry on. No questions. Okay. No questions. Sorry, yes. No questions yet. Uh, no questions. Please. Thank you. Okay, Dakota. Um, take a screenshot because this over here is the outcome of the Coronas trial. And the Coronas trial over then, uh, its outcome was reported in 2016, 10 years after they started it. And it, uh, I just want to show you one or two things. Look over here. It was a, uh, the importance over this for us, it is um, a trial that was done in 19 sites in Argentina, South America in Chile, South America, in Ghana, in India, in Kenya, in Pakistan, and in the Sudan. So these countries over here was where the study was done. And they looked at many, many thousands of people. Let's look at the outcomes of this um, prospective study. Firstly, they said, if you look at abdominal entry, it doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen, how you open the abdomen. You can either do blunt or you can do sharp because the hernia rate subsequently is 1% in both groups. So if you go in sharp or if you go in blunt, the hernia rate subsequently is the same when looking at abdominal entry. Should you take the uterus out or exteriorize the uterus when you repair it or should you repair inside? Well, there's no difference in the outcomes of ectopic or infertility, whether you do exteriorization or repair inside. Should you close the uterus in one layer or should you close the uterus in two layers, a double layer? And the answer is it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter. There's no difference in the subsequent cesarean section rate of rupture or in placenta accreta or in dehiscence of the uterine scar or placenta previa or in abruption. So it doesn't matter 
how you repair it when if you do it inside or outside. Should you close the peritoneum? There's no difference there or there afterwards in the, in the amount of pain a woman has, in the patient's dyspareunia rate, in the patient's infertility rate, or in the patient's ectopic pregnancy rate. So it doesn't matter if you do or don't close the peritoneum, ladies and gentlemen. I would say then obviously you shouldn't close the peritoneum because it takes longer. And then finally, which sutures are the best? Should you use chromic sutures or should you use vicral? And the funny thing is over here, again, it doesn't matter. If you look at the outcome measures, it doesn't matter. So in summary, it doesn't matter how you enter the abdomen. It doesn't matter how you close the uterus. It doesn't matter if you close the peritoneum or not, so you shouldn't. And it doesn't matter which sutures you use. You can use whichever sutures you have available to you. So in this very long, very large randomized controlled trial of looking at 13,000 women, up to four years, it didn't matter, firstly, one technique over another technique. Secondly, it's a very important and powerful study, so it shows you as long as you do one of those things, it doesn't matter what you do. But there's one or two important things. None of those two trials you've seen, that's the American one or the Coronas trial, look at the actual delivery of the baby's head. How should you deliver the baby's head when you've opened the uterus? Traditionally, De Carlo, we do what I call the smash and grab technique, which is um, a very, very generous incision. And then you do fundal pressure and put your hands into the uterus and grab the baby's head, as you can see. That's the traditional way of how you deliver the baby's head from the uterus. But, uh, De Carlo, the problem is nowadays that if you make a generous or a large skin incision, you can get into trouble. You can get taken to court if the woman has complications of us, and the most common complication is pain, and you will lose. You don't want to go to court. I can tell you that. You don't want to go to court. And the important thing here is your incision in the uterus, sorry, your incision in the skin should never exceed 15 centimeters unless there's a specific justification. Because if you go bigger than 15 centimeters in your transverse incision, you have a high risk, 30% risk, of hitting the ileoinguinal nerve, which causes pain, and the woman won't thank you, and if she takes you to court, you'll be in big trouble. I just want to show you this picture over here. This is a video of the WHO method of doing a cesarean section. It's an old video. Look how big that incision is. That's much bigger than 15 centimeters. So you must be very careful if you're going to do a generous incision. And I'm going to show you some options now. I'm just going to read this to you. That's the highlighted bit. A recognized complication of the big incision is damage to the ileoinguinal nerve, and this occurs in up to a third, 30% of cases, resulting in neuroma formation and long-term moderate to severe pain in 8% of cases. This is proven and published. And if you do that, be careful, you might get the summons. There's my name there. You don't want to get summons, ladies and gentlemen. A key point is that the incision should not be longer now. Uh, what have I done over here? Thank you. Now you've gone, you've gone forward. A key important thing is that your incisions should not be longer than 15 centimeters because they would damage. There's a one in three chance of damaging that nerve. And then you're going to get your summons if the woman feels like it and you lose. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's now a legal precedent saying that your transverse incisions should not exceed 15 centimeters without specific justification. So, how are you going to get the baby out if you have to make a smaller incision? Not difficult. The second thing we have to look at, is it important how long it takes you to deliver that baby's head? Is the uterine incision to the fetal delivery interval important? Should you be quick? Or doesn't it matter? Can you take your time in how long it takes to get the baby out? That is a question I'm also going to look at. There's a few, not many, but there's a few publications which look at the time from uterine incision to delivery and hypoxic neonatal outcomes. And this one over here, the effect of time intervals on neonatal outcomes in elective delivery um, at cesarean delivery. So have you got time? Can you take your time to incise the uterus 
and then deliver the baby gently? Or should you have a time limit? Now, I'll tell you right now that if you deliver that baby in under a minute, you're going to be fine. If you take longer than two minutes, that baby has a high chance of being hypoxic. So let's look over here. Can we deliver the fetal head at Caesar quickly, gently, with a smaller incision? And if we can, how are we going to do it, particularly if you're in the rural areas? Now, here's another WHO um, movie of how to deliver the baby. Look, the guy puts his hand in. I assume it's a, a man because it's a very big hand. He puts his hand in and then he's groveling and groveling and groveling. And this is much longer than a minute. When that baby comes out, there's a high degree of risk that that baby is going to be hypoxic. There's a break in the thing and then suddenly the head pops out as if by magic. You daren't take your time. There is a time limit. You're allowed one minute to deliver that baby. If you take longer than two minutes, especially longer than three minutes, there's a very high risk, to Carla, that that baby is going to be born hypoxic. Now, one way you can do it is using a vacuum. This is not new. I've got a whole lot of um, references and data to show that vacuums have been tried. Look here. Here's a vacuum. Uh, delivery of the fetal head with a monster and vacuum extracted during cesarean section. This is from 1962. That's before you were born, Decola. And lots of them over here. Use of the um, vacuum cup to deliver the baby's head. These data are, is 1985. It's old data. Now, what I did is I especially designed this thing over here. That's a soft cup <coughs> vacuum. Six centimeters, made out of silicon. It's uh, designer made my Bedella. It's, it's manufactured in Switzerland. And it comes with this electric vacuum pump called a Medela vacuum pump. It's also made in Switzerland. And what you can do then is deliver the baby's head at cesarean section quicker with a smaller incision. And so it's a safer op operation. We looked at this and uh, this was published in 2018. Look to see using forceps versus uh, vacuum to see the outcomes of fetal head deliveries. We looked at 132 cases and to see was it safe to deliver using a um, vacuum. And we always, I always audit all my cesarean sections. And you can see over here, if you use a vacuum, the average time to deliver the baby's head is 38 seconds, well within your risk. The whole operation for a Caesar takes 16 minutes. So it's quicker to use a vacuum if you use a forceps, it's still within six, it's still within 60 seconds. The operation's a bit longer, 18 minutes. Blood loss is less with a vacuum. Skin incision, look at that, 13 centimeters. So you can make a much shorter incision if you use a vacuum or a forceps to deliver the baby's head. And it also doesn't come with increased uh, um, trauma. Now, just look at this over here. I'm going to show you. Uh, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. These are the sutures I use. The top one over there was a mod. There's a question here. Can, can we give you a question? I'm not sure if it's. No, no, I want questions. Please give more questions. All right. Um, there's a question from Mishak Bokota. Mishak is asking Is it advisable for a junior surgeon to remove fibroid at caesarean section? The answer is no. It's easy. No, don't do it. The only reason I took out that fibroid is it was pedunculated, it was in the way, and that I was scared of knocking it off when I put the uterus back. So don't do it. It's easy, easy answer. Notice over here. So did you hear that? If anybody wants a video, they must just speak to Ashley. Did you get that, Carlo? Yeah, we got that. Thank you so okay. much for that. Okay. Now look here. These are the stitches I usually use. Monocrule. That's called the three four. That's called the three four six. Three. Hang on, that monocle over there is the one we use for the uterus. That's the three seven five eight. Then the next one over here, the next stitch is the uh, sheath stitch. That's PDS. And here is the three four six three. That one over here is a two o monocle, and that is useful for the fat. It's called a universal hemostat because it stops any bleeding. And in this particular case, I happen to use the stapler, but you can also close the skin, obviously, with monocryl. Now, the most important thing, one of the most important things with hemostasis is your surgical technique. Be meticulous the way you do it. Be gentle. Don't be rough. This over here is the stitch that, that stops all bleeding, monocryl 3463. Be very generous with the use of cyclocapron. We spoke about this last time. Cyclocapron is a lifesaver. 
Don't wait. If there's bleeding, give cyclocapron. One of the biggest causes of maternal deaths at cesarean sections in rural areas is bad technique. Use cyclocapron if there's bleeding. Now, you can also use other things that stop the bleeding. They probably aren't available. This over here is Nunit, but there are other products, powder, for example, fibrolol or spongy stand, which can be used. You saw I used it in that Caesar to put on top of the incision to stop any bleeding. When you use cautery to stop bleeding, remember, don't use too much cautery. Rather, if it's a difficult to a big vessel, go and stitch it with the 3463. Because this devitalizes your tissue and cautery then can devascularize, devitalize and cause complications. Poor hemostasis is a very bad thing because poor hemostasis leads to hematomas which cause pain and it might also lead to infection which means you either have to take the patient back and you have to go and do a reduct laparotomy. You might have to have adhesions being caused and that can cause pain and infertility. So it all starts with poor hemostasis not being addressed. You've got to be meticulous in your surgical technique to get a dry field, as you saw over there. The operation shouldn't have more than 200 mils of blood loss. I audit every single Caesar I do. From all sorts of things I look at, the, long, the, the duration of the operation, if it's taking you too long, you're doing something wrong. The average operation over there it took 16 minutes. Now, if you don't have the vacuum, the soft vacuum, you can always use forceps because forceps is just as good as a vacuum. It does a very, very good uh, delivery of the fetal head. It allows you a quicker delivery of the, with, without being so big in your incision. And I looked at a randomized trial of uh, forceps versus vacuum, and the forceps is just as good as a vacuum. In this randomized trial, we find the, this is a randomized controlled trial of forceps versus vacuum for delivery of the fetal head. Vacuum average delivery interval was 47 seconds, the forceps 58. So it's a bit quicker to do vacuums. The total operation time for vacuum, again, the Caesar is a bit quicker to use a vacuum because there's less blood loss. You can see the blood loss is less. There's more caput in the, in the vacuum, but there's more laceration of the baby's head, gen, general laceration in the forceps. The other things like the ease of delivery, the APCO of the baby, NICU admissions and maternal admissions exactly the same in forceps versus vacuums. Look over uh, here. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry to disturb. We've got questions. No, you're not disturbing. Raining questions. And I think the next question is possibly what you are about to say. Uh, yes. First question is, what about swabbing the cavity, the uterine cavity? What is your advice with that? Will that not cause endometriosis? Swabbing the uterine cavity, yeah. If you're going to swab the uterine cavity, a swab, to call it, is a very rough thing. It's like using sandpaper. I, I do a lot of carpentry. My hobby is carpentry and making wooden things. And when you use sandpaper and a swab, it's the same thing. If you're going to swab, be gentle and use a wet swab. Next question. Next question, Pete, is saying that please and please and please, Pete, show us where to cut. Where is the lower segment? Okay, I'll show you in the next video. The next video will show you again. You mustn't cut too low. One of the most common problems, DiCarlo, and I'm being very serious here, is when you cut too low on the lower segment. When you do almost a supra cervical Caesar, don't cut too low. Go higher than you actually expect because when you cut too low, you're going to get terrible bleeding and it's very difficult to repair. So you'll see when I do it, and you'll also see if you want the video, the, you speak to Ashley, she'll give it to you. You cut almost higher than you've ever seen and ever expected. So cut higher on the lower segment, rather, rather too high than too low. Next question. If I decide to do two layers, does it matter which one I start as a locking suture and the other one as a continuous suture? A very good question. Should you lock? Yeah, I lock them all. I lock them all. So I lock the first one and the lock the second one. Um, but just be gentle. Don't pull too hard. Don't strangulate the tissue. Don't hurt the tissue. Be gentle. It's a woman's tissue. So you can lock them both, both layers, just be gentle and so you don't strangulate it. Because if you strangulate the tissue, you reduce the blood supply. Next question. Yeah, there's still more questions. Maybe would you like to continue and then we will go back okay. to the question. Okay, okay. Uh, here's another Caesar.
Yeah, I'm excited in the old school. I'm excited in the old school. I'm using pottery. There we're going to the fat. Yeah, we're into the sheep. Actually, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know the I don't know the that's what I'm just saying. I usually go sharp as you can see. Then I can open the okay. have a bit of attention. There's the retractors. Now watch here. Swap on the floor, eh? Now I'm going to open the... Excellent, yeah, that should be nice. Is there a I'll tell you when. I ordered everything, that's why you hear the news the same thing. Okay, I'll tell you when, wait, wait, wait. Now. I cut high. Look there, I'm yeah. cutting high. Not low. There's the baby's head. I tear open the uterus from the first Out the water. There's the vacuum. Mm -hmm. That's where everything's good. Takes four seconds to make the vacuum. Gently, there's no resistance. Mm -hmm. Take your time, gently. No resistance. Out comes the baby gentleman. Big baby. This one is the size of the head. Also, the top of the pot theory. The better one. Yes, and. Sterilization takes one minute and 40 seconds. 
If you want, stop the thing. That's a productive and fiber that we adopted off. Remember, we don't touch fiber. So you can close your eyes and think. I thought it was big, so. Big and productive and fiber. Light loss or no light loss? So we want to get this back without knocking off anything. There's a sponge on the lower deck. That sponge is that bleeding. Blue ribbons and go for it. Closing the sheet. Um, one five and two. Yeah. 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 A little bit. Operation is expected. Don't be afraid. Sports model cheese got done. There was a little fibroid that broke from the womb. Taking that it made it beautiful. Put the put something not releasing. There you go. And now we staple. I staple close the useful, uh, the skin I mean. They are put the staple in. These are dissolvable, resorbable staples. They don't have to be removed. It gives a very good job. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Now, why is it six centimeters? The previous guy that has a big uh, Caesar that took sixteen centimeters wasn't me. A month later, just look at that scar. Uh, actually, do you see any scar over there a month after the operation? No, I don't. Thank you. The scar is virtually invisible, De Carlo, uh, using the scapel. Staple. <laughs> Any more questions to Carlo? Yes, there are questions actually related to what you said. They're saying, which one is best from V-Way? Which one is best with the skin closure uh, for infection and cosmetic reasons? Is it the okay. staple or the sutures? Okay. Now, the first thing is this. This is private practice. They have staples because it's quicker, much quicker, and it gives a beautiful aesthetic result. Because in private practice, you're paying 200 Rand a minute. So if you can save a couple of minutes, that stapler thing costs 600 Rand. And if you can make your skin closure closer uh, sooner than three minutes, you save the price of the stapler. You can do sutures, which give you an excellent, use monocryl subcut. That's what you will use. The WHO recommends three or four interrupted silk, which is, uh, I would say, not a good idea. Use subcut monocryl de Carlo. Subcrat monocryl, and you'll have a beautiful result just like this. Next question. Just address with the issue of infection, uh, Pete, if you choose, more especially in a public hospital, uh, where you also worried about infection. So if you use subcut, um, the issues of if it's the area is infected, where you have to now open the whole area. Okay, if it's, uh, if it's infected and you're worried about, say it is a very long and difficult labor, she's a very obese woman, and surgical technique wasn't always easy, then I would do interrupted monocryls. But I wouldn't do three or four, I'd do a few more. So you can take one or two stitches out to let the pus out or the serum out as required. Next question. Brilliant. The next question, Pete, is saying, can you address when uh, the option when you have a deeply uh, embedded uh, head, yeah. fetal head uh, during cesarean section, what is your advice when the head is in the pelvis? 
A very important question. It's a very dangerous, very, very dangerous condition. When the head is impacted, the danger here is that it can cause horrific injuries. Now, I would say the best thing to do is get your best midwife. And before you do the Caesar, she actually disimpacts the head. In other words, she puts her head under the drapes and elevates the fetal head, not with her fingers, but with her hand. If you're going to go and push that baby up with your fingers, you're going to push your fingers right through the baby's skull. And you're going to fracture the skull. So rather use your hand and be gentle. Elevate the baby's head. And when you do the cesarean section, leave that midwife's hand in over there to elevate the baby's head. When you open the uterus, open the uterus very high, not low. Open it very high. And then you can take the baby's head out that way. You won't need a, a forceps or a, or a vacuum because the head will just pop out. Next question. Next question, Pip. Can we uh, clamp the corners instead of putting a stitch? That's the question with the green armitages. Yeah, you can. But I like stitching because um, I'm very particular about hemostasis. And once I put the stitches in and finish closing the uterus in two layers, I go back and have a very careful look. If there's any bleeding, I go and stitch the extra bleeders closed with a 3463, which is 2 monocrule, because I don't want to come back. You'd be surprised how the uterus can bleed. You can try misoprostol, you can try cyclocapron, fine, but rather be very meticulous by using interrupted figure of eight uh, 2 o monocrule stitches. Next question. Then, Spitz, just to say uh, that Spongo stand and also the powder, it comes with a warning that it doesn't close the uterine artery. So if you, left, you leave the uterine artery bleeding and you put a Spongo stand, she will continue to bleed. She uh, will that's bleed to death and die. She will die. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't secure hemostasis of the uterine artery, you will stand up in court and you will go to prison. Listen to me. Um, you will go to prison. You've got to be um, careful. At the end of closing the uterine uh, incision, you've got to have a bone dry. That, those spongy stand and that uh, arista and stuff is for a gentle oozer on the bladder. Because remember, you can't go and cauterize the bladder. You're going to go right through, and you would know that. You've got to be very careful if you cauterize bladders. You'll go straight through cause a fistula. So be very gentle on the bladder. Better to put in stitches or if there's a gentle, if you say there's a very large raw area, that's when you would use the spongy stand, and that's when you would use the sponge. A very large raw area. You don't want to go and do anything over there. You can't stitch. You can't cauterize. You put your spongy stand or your arista, and then you put pressure there for three or four minutes. That's what you do. The other question related to what, to what you just said, Pete, it's saying, in a patient with previous scissors, should you try to blindly dissect or push the bladder down or just incise the uterus above it? Both. You incise the uterus above it, then you push the bladder down. And if at the end you've got a lot of bleeders under the bladder, that's when you can use your spongy stand or your fibro law or whatever you've got. And pressure and those hemostats is what you need. But be careful of, of, of a lot of cauterize and the cautery ne next to the bladder. You'll make a hole in that bladder and then you'll have a fistula and then you'll be in trouble. Another question related to just what you said is saying that if I don't have the cautery, what are, what are the best ways to minimize bleeding? Yeah, if you don't have cautery, use, if you don't have 3463, which is 2 a monocrule, use uh, 441 is the uh, equivalent in the state sector of uh, 2 o um, chromic. 441, make a note of that. 441 is a very nice stitch to use. So use 441 if you don't have cautery, and uh, also use uh, pressure, and also use misoprostol. The woman's awake. Let it chew on some misoprostol, and then also use some cyclocapron. Next question. One gram cyclocapron IV. Okay. The other question from Tabazimbi. What's the best approach to adhesions from previous season? The best approach, if you have a cautery, is to gently, um, if they're big, thick adhesions, you're going to have to clamp them, tie them off, and cut in between. If they're filmy adhesions, use the cautery on um, on cut and you cut them. So it depends how big they are. Big ones, you've got to treat them with respect, clamp them and 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 cut and cut them um, between the clamps. So if they're filmy, you can use the cautery. If they're big, be respectful and rather clamp and cut. Yes. 
Yes, the uh, other question is that you talked about uh, prophylactic antibiotics before yeah. What about post cesarean section? No, we only use, only if the woman is, uh, has actual sepsis. Say she's got a very, very long labor and she's become septic. Then you would continue. You would continue and be very careful over there with, with sepsis. I would continue then um, with uh, Kefsol. And maybe you can also use, if you think there's sepsis, De Carlo, use triple antibiotics because you can very easily end up with hysterectomy. So rather use pengent and flagell if you think at the time of cesarean section, she's already septic. Yeah. All right. Pete, you can continue. There's still more questions here, but uh, just continue. We'll finish up with the questions. Okay. Um, now, the last question, I told you there were two. Now, here's the third thing. Right. Uh, on your uh, on your piece of paper up to date because this is a wonderful wonderful resource up to date is an american publication which gives you excellent step-by-step -step descriptions of how to do a caesar and it'll tell you certain things you should not do you don't have to cut the rectus muscle you don't have to do cervical dilatation you don't have to take out your appendix you don't have to wash the wound with irrigation you don't have to use abdominal lavage to wash out the peritoneum. You don't have to use adhesion barriers, like I've said. You can if you want to. You mustn't do myomectomy, as I've said, and you mustn't <coughs> placate or stitch close the rectus muscle, and you don't have to use drains routinely. That's things you mustn't do. Um, one last thing. If you're going to do lots of cesarean sections, um, you've got to be careful because the Caesarean section scar can cause problems, and if you've got a uh, placenta which goes and sits in a on a caesarean section scar, particularly if it's previa, you can have those placentas that go um, go go wild and go um, completely out of control. They go through the uterus, they end up in the bladder, and this over here, we're lucky to have what is called a hybrid theatre, and what happens? This was my Dutch looking lady. There she was standing in the hybrid theatre. We had a placenta that went rogue. The patient was put on this table and we used um, intravascular balloons in the internal iliac arteries. We put her to, uh, on this table. She had um, a placenta that went right into the bladder, went completely rogue through everything, and we were able to save her, um, uh, the baby. We did the caesarean section when the caesar was over and the placenta was out. We blew up. As soon as the baby was delivered, we blew up the balloons in the internal iliac arteries so she didn't bleed to death. At a later stage, she had to have a hysterectomy. So don't do too many cesarean sections. If you're going to do more than four cesarean sections, you're going to get into trouble with that placenta going rogue. And that's all. Let's have some more questions, um, to Carlo. Yes, there are so many questions. Uh, Pritz, uh, they're saying that, are you advising that we teach the young doctors how to do assisted delivery during cesarean section? Well, I tell you this, for me, when I've opened the uterus, I'm sitting in um, Jane Furs Hospital in Sekakuni land. How am I going to get that head out of that uh, uterus? Everybody, even Jane Furs has got Wrigley's forceps. You put on the forceps onto the baby and that head pops out. In under a minute, that baby's out. You don't have such a big incision. The baby's doing well because you're not having to make a big incision to grovel that baby out. And you're not having to push so hard on the fundus and cause um, intestinal damage. So anybody can learn this technique. It's easily done. And that's what I would suggest you have to consider just by popping on those forceps. You don't have to have a uh, silicon vacuum. You don't have to have an electric vacuum pump but if you have it it's even easier next question is there benefit on the peritoneal closure during cesarean section no next question okay and the other question um pete you said they were looking at from the abdominal entry they were looking only at the hernia part and there was no difference between blunt and sharp correct but they look at the bleeding if one has more risk of bleeding and the, uh, than the other According to the randomized control trial, there's no difference. Now, I like uh, no blood, as I've said a couple of times before, but use the technique that gives you um, the most gentle operation um, options with the least blood, whatever suits you. That's why I'm not telling anybody to change. I'm saying do what you like, do what is gentle and gives you the best uh, outcomes with the least blood loss.
to call our next question. Brilliant. Um, the other question, let me quickly check it. While I'm checking, Pete, what about the figure of eight when you're suturing the uterus instead of continuous suture? Yeah, I suppose if you put a series of figures of eight, that would be okay. As long as you get at the end to call a proper hemostasis. Remember, I'm not prescriptive. I haven't told anybody once to do what I do. I've just said, do what suits you best, what gives the best outcome, the gentlest operation with the best hemostasis. So that's all I'm saying. Remember, an important thing to Carlo, I do lots of cesarean sections. I do lots of vaginal deliveries. I do lots of vacuums. I do more than anybody else vaginal deliveries. So I'm a hands-on guy. I spend my days in the labor ward doing obstetrics. I'm not an academic. I'm a simple jobbing obstetrician. So people that do an award round and have a clever professor standing and saying, no, you should have done this, you should have done that. I'll tell you what suits me because I do a lot of them. I've done thousands of Caesars, thousands of vaginal deliveries. As I say, I've been doing them since I was in third year in Tembiza Hospital, and I've done more than most people. So I know what works and what doesn't work. Next question. I thought you were born the, that way. I didn't believe that was your picture in there, in that initially on your presentation. Was it you? It <laughs> was me. No, I was born bald. No, that I was thought, me. I thought you were born that way. But there are so many questions. Let's try to attempt to go through them. So the other one is saying, I have struggled many times delivering a floating head at, yeah. at what is the best and safe method of delivering a, um, that baby? Who's Either a vacuum or a forceps. That's all. Nothing else. A vacuum or a forceps for a floating head, ideal. Next question. The other question is that what is the best approach for a transverse lie? This is from Tabazimbi again. Okay, transverse lie. Put your hands in and see if you can find some legs or some feet. Then convert it into a breech and then pull on the uh, feet of the baby. Uh, that's the easiest way. Incidentally, talking about uh, vacuums, there is a book called um, uh, Vacuums, and there is a, also a slide. Can we just look at the last slide? There's a book on vacuums I wrote many years ago, and uh, just go back to those slides, and um, just let's see, at the very end of the talk, see if you can find it. Uh, next. Uh, just hang on. Nah, nah, that's something, that's another talk. Go, 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 go. No, nah, I don't know, it seems to have fallen off. But there is a book, and if anybody's interested in how to do vacuums, there's a book on the subject, and uh, I'll give you the reference. Sorry, next question. All right, there are so many. So uh, this one is from Mulifi saying, this was very excellent presentation. He thank you with all his heart that, um, uh, he's saying that with this presentation, he believes that he's going to improve his skill. Inshallah. Inshallah. And then the other uh, question is saying, uh, I think this is a statement, but uh, let's pose it as a question. Is it advisable for a junior MO to do cesarean section on patients with platelets of 50 at the district hospital? I'm not sure. If this, this is a full loaded question. <laughs> it's easy. Send her to the highest level hospital you can because you might need to have a blood bank nearby. But also, don't forget, if there's bleeding, don't forget, as I said, the cyclocapron and the misoprostol. That'll save lives. Next question. Next question. Previous scissor times two. Most of the time, there's a lot of adhesions. What yeah. do you recommend? Uh, can it be done in a district hospital or tertiary hospital? I think if you're experienced, it can be done in a district hospital, yeah. Just be right. gentle. Yeah, next question. The other question, the role of letting blood flow from the cord if the patient is RH positive. Yeah, you can clamp the cord as soon as the baby pops out. If it's term, there's a slightly higher risk of uh, fetal hemolytic disease if you give it too much blood. You can give it lots of extra blood in a premature or an IUGR baby. That's when you would do delayed cord clamping is in small babies. At term, it doesn't matter so much. Next question. Uh, Pit, I think it's going to four o'clock. There's still more raining of questions here. Um, people are really very happy with the, your presentation and they are asking more questions. Let me see if I can get grab I'll one. i tell you what, Nicola, I know that we have to end at four because we've run out of uh, internet, but they can just send their questions to uh, Ashley and I'll answer them on the, on the email if you want. Marvelous. 
Pete, uh, let me thank you. I know there are a lot of people who have been watching and uh, listening to you. If we check at the participants here, we've got around 222 devices connected to you. And I know multiple wow. hospitals are watching uh, at, at least less than uh, around 50 people in one uh, computer in those hospitals. Wow. So Amazing. this is very excellent. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, we're looking forward for another another kind of this kind of talks. Uh, how do you say it, Pete? In a South African way, let's salute Pete by clapping the hands. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, I'm sure we'll meet you again with the other uh, presentations coming, right? Yes, you will. <laughs>